Hello and welcome to episode 5 of my sports and exercise science series. We're going to be following on from episode 4 by beginning to learn about the muscular and nervous system. Let's start off with the muscular system. The muscular system is responsible for the movement of the body. Bones of the skeletal system create attachment points for approximately 700 named muscles and these muscles make up 30 to 50% of a person's body weight dependent on genetics, gender and lifestyle. Muscles allow us to walk, run, jump, stand upright and also help to resist forces placed on the body. The muscular and nervous systems are intimately connected as muscles cannot function without the activation of nerves. When nerve impulses are transmitted to muscles, the muscles then respond by producing a contraction. There are three types of muscle found in the body and these are skeletal, cardiac and smooth muscle. Let's start with cardiac muscle. Cardiac muscle is only found in the heart and is responsible for pumping blood throughout the body. Cardiac muscle tissue cannot be controlled consciously, so it is an involuntary muscle controlled by the autonomic nervous system. Hormones and signals from the brain, however, can adjust the rate of contraction. I'm sure you've heard of the stress hormones adrenaline and cortisol. You may have experienced yourself a feeling of heavy stress or anxiety when you felt your heart beat faster than normal. The natural pacemaker of the heart is made of cardiac tissue which stimulates other cardiac muscle cells to contract. This self-stimulation is why cardiac muscle is considered to be autorhythmic or intrinsically controlled. Cardiac muscle is characterized as striated muscle because when examined microscopically it presents a striated appearance which is almost identical to that of skeletal muscle. Organisationally, striated muscle fibres, whether skeletal or cardiac, are composed of sarcoplasm and a collection of organelles, much like most other cells. However, the most prominent organelles are the particularly abundant parallel myofibrils that are bundles of contractile proteins of actin and myosin filaments. Smooth muscle. Smooth muscle is found inside of organs such as the stomach, intestines and blood vessels. Smooth muscle is the weakest of all muscle tissues and is like cardiac muscle as it is also under the control of the autonomic nervous system and thus involuntary in action. That is, as we have no control over smooth muscle contraction. Smooth muscle gets its name because it has a smooth, uniform-like appearance when viewed under a microscope and unlike cardiac and skeletal muscle, smooth muscle is non-striated. Smooth muscle cytoplasm contains large amounts of actin and myosin which act as the main proteins for muscle contraction. Finally, we have skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle is the only voluntary muscle tissue in the human body as it is controlled consciously. This means that every physical action you perform consciously, such as running, jumping, walking, all requires skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle cells form when many small progenerator cells lump themselves together to form long, straight, multinucleated fibers which are striated like cardiac muscle. Skeletal muscle derives its name from the fact that these muscles always connect to the skeleton in at least one place. Most skeletal muscles are attached to two bones through tendons. Tendons are tough bands of regular connective tissue whose strong collagen fibers attach muscles to bones. Tendons are under extreme stress when muscles pull on them, so they are very strong and woven into the coverings of muscle and bones. Muscles move by shortening their length, pulling on tendons and moving bones closer to each other. One of the bones is pulled towards the direction of the other bone, which remains stationary. The location on the stationary bone that is connected via tendons to the muscle is called the origin. The place on the moving bone that is connected to the muscle via tendons is called the insertion. The belly of the muscle is the fleshy part of the muscle in between both tendons that does the actual contraction. Let's now move on to the functions of skeletal muscle. There are three main functions of skeletal muscle, one of which we've just covered which is to produce human movement. The other two functions are to stabilise the body and produce heat. Skeletal muscle contractions help to stabilise joints to keep them in the correct position and to keep the whole body in a stable position which helps to maintain body posture. Certain muscles such as those found in the legs have a specific function of holding the body upright against the force of gravity which acts down on it. When we get cold skeletal muscles contract rapidly and we shiver. This is the body's natural response to raise body temperature known as thermoregulation. 
The opposite effect of shivering, of course, is sweating, the evaporation of water, in which sweat causes cooling. Now let's look at some of the major muscles of the body. Of course, we can't cover all 700 muscles, but we can cover a basic overview of the major ones. Let's start with the deltoids, which are the shoulder muscles. The deltoids are responsible for shoulder abduction, shoulder flexion, and shoulder extension. The biceps are located here at the front of the upper arm. The biceps help to control the shoulder and elbow joints, as well as being essential in lifting and flexing the elbow. The biceps also assist in supination, which is used in tasks such as using a screwdriver. The triceps are located here at the back of the arm. The triceps help to stabilize the shoulder joint and allow for the elbow joint to be straightened. You would use the triceps in everyday life when extending the elbow, for example, to throw a ball. The pectoral muscles, which consist of the pectoralis major and minor, are the muscles that make up the chest and are often shortened to the word pecs. Your pectoral muscles provide support when you hold objects in front of your body and are activated when you reach across the body, for example, when you put on a seatbelt. The abdominals, located here, assist in the breathing process, protection of inner organs and in twisting motions, for example, looking behind yourself. The abdominals play a part in bending over motions and maintaining good posture. The obliques are to the side of the abdominals and provide support in twisting and bending motions as they support the spine from the front. This large kite-shaped muscle in the upper back is known as your trapezius, or for short, sure, the traps. This muscle, due to its large size, can be divided into three sections known as the upper, mid and lower traps. The upper fibers of the trapezius elevate the scapula and rotate it during abduction of the arm. The mid fibers retract the scapula and the lower fibers pull the scapula inferiorly. So the upper fibers shrug the shoulders, the mid fibers retract the shoulder blades and the lower fibers depress and pull the scapula down. The lats or latissimus dorsi muscle shown here is used when you pull something towards your body. For example, if you was playing tug of war, you would be using your lats. If you was to reach for food at the supermarket on the top shelf, you would be using your lats. And in sports such as swimming, the latissimus dorsi muscle is heavily used as well. The erector spinae are located here and are deep muscles which help to extend the spine and help to maintain posture. The erector spinae muscles also help to bend the spine forwards and sideways. The glutes are located here and are your butt muscles. The main three anatomically are known as your gluteus medius, minimus and maximus. The glutes help to move your legs backwards and sideways and help the body to maintain balance such as when you walk or run. The hamstrings are located here at the backs of your legs and consist of three muscles, the semimembranosus, semitendinosus and biceps femoris. The hamstrings function to flex your knees and help to propel the body forward in movements such as running or jumping. Lower down the backs of your legs, we have the calves. These are key muscles when you lift your heels up, walk, run, go upstairs, and are heavily involved in explosive movements such as sprinting or jumping. Finally, we have the four quadricep muscles, anatomically known as the vastus medialis, vastus lateralis, vastus intermedius, and rectus femoris. These muscles help to extend the knee and straighten the legs, stabilize the knee joint, and are involved heavily in movements such as squatting, walking, running, and hip rotation. The last topic we're going to cover is why understanding Latin and Greek helps in anatomy. Hearing words such as latissimus, trapezius, and vastus can all be very confusing when initially learning anatomy. Muscles are derived from the Latin and Greek languages, and once you understand the meaning of these Latin and Greek terms, learning the anatomy of the body becomes far easier and also more interesting and understandable. Please do not think, however, that a Latin degree or Greek degree is necessary when learning anatomy. You just need to know enough to initially get by. Here are some of my own tips and tricks for those looking to learn anatomical language. Tip 1. Look for the familiar lots of English words that are derived from Latin, so they may look and sound familiar. If you can find these links, they often can tell you something about the muscle. If a muscle is called longus, for example, what do you think that tells us about the muscle's shape? It must be long, right? Earlier in the video, I said the word rectus, which you heard when I said the rectus femoris was one of the four quadricep muscles. So what do you think the word rectus would mean? If you rectify something, you straighten it out. 
Similarly, you might see a muscle described as rectus, which tells us that the muscle is straight. Tip two, look for patterns. When anatomists found a good name for one thing, they often decided to copy it with a slight tweak. Finding these patterns can help find out what a word means. For example, the words biceps, triceps, and quadriceps. You can work out that bi means two, tri means three, and quad means four. What could these numbers be referring to, however? If we look at the muscles, they're composed of multiple muscle bellies, or these can be described as heads. Biceps have two heads, triceps have three, quadriceps have four, so the word sep must mean muscle belly or head. Tip three, break the names down. When you see a name such as extensor digitorum longus, it is only natural to panic. However, if we look at each individual word, it may not be as complicated as it seems. First, we have extensor. Muscles can be named referring to four things, including their size, shape, action, and position. So this muscle is extending something, right? It must extend our digitorum, which sounds very similar to the word digit. Search the word digit in a dictionary and you'll notice that firstly it says a digit is a numeral and it will then also say that a digit is a finger, toe or thumb. Therefore this muscle must extend a finger, toe or thumb. The final piece of the puzzle is the word longus, suggesting that this is a long muscle. So we've gone from panicking about the muscle name and wanting to give up to now narrowing down the muscle size, possible location and knowing the muscle action. The extensor digitorum longus is in the leg and it extends the toes. That concludes the fifth episode of my sports and exercise science series. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and don't forget to like and subscribe for more free and educational content. You've been watching UK Fitness Hub. I've been Travis Tarrant and I'll see you soon in the next episode where we begin study on the different types of muscle actions.